squat, 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 For years, we've screamed. Whether it's Forza as an offload look like it's finally going to stick or shut it as another pundit suggested kicking them to the curb. For five years now, believing in Italy has been tantamount to shriek therapy. The loudest fans in rugby trying to manifest the climax of what's been a 24 year project that looks like it's finally been coming towards fruition. And yet, as so many of those hopes, those themes, those dreams, those long term aspirations look to be slotting together on Sunday, instead, we all fell silent for 90 straight seconds at the death believing alone was so almost enough this weekend italy were an inch a mere inch away from possibly the greatest upset in six nations history defeating france in france for the first time in tournament history got Beezy's late shot hitting the post to leave the two teams tied in another six nations first a heroic italian effort showing results just not yet the one they wanted so how did italy come so close achieve that draw what might have taken them over the edge and after a second straight last gasp escape denying them three straight losses what the hell is wrong with France right now? Whilst the points only came as the first 40 came to a close, the Italian effort on Sunday was very much characterised, defined and built in the first half as elements the Azuri lacked under Kieran Crowley came together in a compelling, fascinating soup of progress. Sometimes messy, but delicious, hot and just a tiny little bit of seasoning away from being really quite special. There's a newfound cleanliness to the way Italy play. It's a weird thing to praise, but just the way they clear from the kickoff is a huge improvement on last year. Martin Pajrello had an excellent afternoon, his reliable kicking game and quietly excellent defence, giving it the foundation on which other players built. Tommaso Menoncello was exceptional, and Michele Lamro near his best as Italy's defence got properly under French skin. The try for Capuzzo and penalty to win it might have been the moments that deservedly get the attention, but for me, the standout passage of the match, and from an Italian perspective, the entire Six Nations so far, came in the first half half as from this steal at the line out onwards Italy withstood 19 minutes and 46 seconds of consecutive French attack without conceding a point for just 14 seconds shy of 20 straight minutes every single breakdown took place inside the Italian half and in all but three of them it was French possession and yet Italy held France out without leaking a single score 10 nil down knowing another try could create an unassailable lead Italy defended with blood guts and above all brains here, France ran a lovely move looking to target tight-head Zalocki. Here, at the back of the line-out and open hole, it's a dummy mall call with Malvaca wrapping around and working in field to fix the first defenders before Dante cuts against the grain to draw those breaking away from the mall, except he's a decoy too. Penno is cutting a lovely line against only, hopefully, Zalocki. There's only one issue, right? And it's called Michele Lamoureux. The moment the ball comes in, the world's greatest shout of C size go not to the mall, not to the surrounding area but to Malvaca, the hooker specifically. And when he doesn't slow down to join the bastard, when he keeps running around, Lamro tells his pack to ignore them all, break off, it's a dummy play. They all listen, Lamro tracks to take Malvaca himself, meaning when Dante comes at Zalocchi, and Zalocchi takes the wrong man, it's no bother. There's four Italians in position to stop Penno. France are expecting clean breaks, so they haven't baked a support runner into the move, allowing Nicotera, who was outstanding, to just blow past the ball, knocking Luku off balance and leaving a rebooting, disorganised French side. Jalabert spies some space on the short side and hits Olivon, but Paz Rello makes a brilliant tackle, and as Woki is forced to smash Ioani off the ball, it leaves an opening for Rutsa, so Antonio flops over the rock, and instead it just presents the ball for Lamro, swooping in third man to win an incredible turnover. Or here, off turnover ball, won by Ruck Perth, Francois Crow, France spread it wide immediately, Jalabert looking to dart himself and get right up to the try line. However, as he did all day, the Azuri pack disrupts the ruck beautifully. Fiku forced to carry it in and if we look at the wide shot here right, France are set up for a score. They have numbers, they have options, they have width and they only have 10 metres to go. But Italy have the art of shithousery. Daniello Fischetti, who once again is world class around the park, fights his way onto the outside of the ruck just about legally here and when referee Ridley calls him to stop, he plants his foot tactically right in front of the ball. Unable to now spin off the base, this forces Luca to pick it up, double pumping a pass so high it goes above Ponzo to Alangi's head, meaning he has to jump for it above his head, and when delivering it back to the boot, he overcompensates for the previous pass and drops it round Ramos's ankles. This takes further pace out of the whole attack, meaning Dante has now overrun the play, yet Ramos tries to thread the ball to him regardless. The pass goes loose, and whilst Penno picks it up and does superbly, the clean cut chance is gone. Italy have covered it. France pick and go for a while remaining close to the line, but Italy never breaking until here. France hit the outside man off this pod, Malvaca hears a call from Jalabert so tries to pull it back behind him, except Jalabert has flattened up to get on his outside to try and draw Yawani here, he can't recover. The pass has gone behind him, it's a knock on and another attack over. 
Or here, from a penalty, France take a scrum. I call you suspect they wouldn't have made against most teams, but Italy or Italy, they beat by 60 points in the World Cup. And so, from that scrum, Pajrello does brilliantly. His position here is completely illegal, but the referee hasn't warned him yet, so he carries on until a second he does. Bourdon, meanwhile, has done an atrocious job allowing Pajarello to get completely amongst his 9 and 10 to disrupt the ball. Luca has to dive past it away. Everything's on slow motion. There's no pace or purpose to the French attack. It's slow ball, defence primed, and Garbizzi makes a brilliant tackle, allowing the two flankers to then wrap around the next phase. Lamro makes a great contact on Bourdon, and France are now stuck going backwards. France plays six phases here, yet never cross the initial gain line, never overcome the damage done in those first two phases, eventually leading to this. As Jalibert flashes back, Bourdon sniffs a first test try in the making and calls for a cross kick that is never on. Jalibert trusts his teammate but is on the run so it's off target, goes straight out on the full. A terrible option, executed very badly. Because I could go on, there's so many instances from this passage of Italy just fronting up, making their tackles and withstanding pressure on the try line. It was extraordinary stuff. And yet, while I think Italy's defence being brilliant deserves most of the credit for this patch, there has to be one big element in any situation like this. One big question that he's asking. What the hell has happened to France's attack? Now, the emotional hangover of the World Cup remains grand, but whilst that might mean they can't match Ireland's intensity during a tight game, I'm not sure it explains failing to score a try after 20 straight minutes on the Italian line. Instead, I feel that comes back to three components that France in 2024 are missing. Well, no, four components, but the fourth one, as it happens, I have it on good authority, Fabian Gauti has solved himself in the last week when he went to NordVPN. Ever since the World Cup, Fabian has slipped into paranoia, worried about his internet security constantly, day and night worried about malware, intrusive ads, tracking his every internet movement. That was until a few weeks ago when he subscribed to NordVPN. Signing up quickly and so easily, Fabian was able to install the NordVPN app onto all of his devices instantaneously, simultaneously, probably even onto his goggles. I haven't checked. The mere click of a button tap of his phone, allowing him to download and then switch to hundreds of nations worldwide, changing his IP address, protecting his own data whilst also tackling geo-blocking, able to better research opponents by signing in to watch URC games from Italy himself, get the Italian commentary, hear what they want to say. Even speeding up his own internet, NordVPN has become a critical part now of Fabian Galtier's life. You can you can ask him and he'll probably say we oui, and it can become a part of yours as well if you head to nordvpn.com forward slash squidge rugby to receive, get this right, you'll not just get a huge discount on a two-year subscription but four months free as well. And better yet, with a 30-day money-back guarantee, there is no risk whatsoever if you don't love it as much as Fabian. But you will. You will love it, because he loves it. Of the other three reasons, however, the first two are the most discussed, and frankly, with good reason, because who wouldn't miss Untermac and Dupont? Antoine Dupont is the world's best rugby player, and taking him out of any team will damage them, but what we saw during the two-week national crisis that woke up was just how effective Le Bleu can be, especially against Italy, even without their beautiful boys at 9 and 10. I do think Untermac would have helped them put perhaps more structure and sense into what was frequently a quite loose attack, and obviously Antoine Dupont's usually good for a ridiculous try or two, but really... I think there's another halfback partner that France are missing more than anyone else. But that's not Maxime's or Matteo's. It's Fabian's. For the last four years, France's attack has been world-beating under the tutelage of Fabian Gauthier's old halfback partner and genius attack coach, Laurent Labitte. Labitte's philosophy on attack frankly defined the 2019-2023 to cycle of international rugby and can be boiled down to thus. Good attack begins with good kicking. Attack to France wasn't a separate part of the game. It was the top of a pyramid the rest of the sport builds up to. Your defence, your set piece, your kicking all feed the attack or feed the flame. Instead of an island-style strict shape, structures and positionings, a libido attack was often loose, improvisational, yet excelled because instead of trying to create an attack that worked in all scenarios, France would deploy tactics that would guide them only into situations where unstructured attack would really work against defences open to conceding to it. However, post-World Cup, Labide has left the national team to take over as head coach at Stade Francais from, wouldn't you know it, Gonzalo Quesada, the new Italy coach. And now, in a year, France have gone from the team in this tournament who kick the most to the team who kick the least. They've gone from the team who kicked the longest to the team who kicked the shallowest, and they've gone from the team who scores the most tries to only one above Italy at the tail of the table. France have scored fewer tries than Wales. France used to love long kicking battles, looking to manipulate the opponent into giving them chances to counter-attack, yet that appears gone. 
Here they run a lovely setup to get Ramos into kicking position, but it's a bad kick and literally cover it quickly with Capowuzzo replying superbly. And instead of keeping going, instead of battling back and forth, Ramos concedes the duel, putting it out on the full, handing Italy the ball around the same position as their initial possession. They didn't try to launch another duel all game. Instead, we saw them endlessly playing on their own half until they knocked it on and got turned over around that halfway line. Any kicking instead, either little chips, speculative, or contestable, hung high balls off nine. Kicking has gone from the plan to a very, very reluctant plan B, maybe even C, and it's hamstrung France. The team, so much easier to defend, and not creating those kind of broken field chances they were so good at exploiting. In fact, France's two best passages of the second half are both exceptions to that rule. France here are going nowhere, making no real ground, and then, as Fiku fumbles, Menicello makes what is a highly suitable tackle of the day. France are backpedalling, and Lebel goes for a speculative chip. Capuz just about regathers, but Varney's clearance isn't great. It's got no real hang time, and yet doesn't find touch, meaning France have a perfect chance of counter-attack with no real chase coming. Peno puts Mofan into half a hole, and he barrels forward. And whilst they eventually do get turned over because of great Italian defence, they have proper momentum briefly. The other comes from opportunism by Maxime Luku. Noting there's nobody on the short side, Ramos flashes round, and when it draws Menoncello up, Luku stabs it in behind, and under pressure, Capuzzo's clearance is really hurried as panicked, with no chance to place it to aim whatsoever. Mabel recovers, and launches a fantastic counter-attack. France keep the ball alive and quickly draw a penalty, which they knock over shortly enough for their only points of the second half. Their only points after the 15th minute. I'll be honest, right? I can't tell what Patrick Arletaz is trying to do with the French attack. It feels like they're only half the team they were before. He's just taken away ingredients, making them now a distinctly average soup to return to that analogy it's possible that they're just not quite sure yet how to run his system that they're changing something and it isn't quite working ramos here for example has a bollock to alangi and malvaca for being lazy and not getting into position quickly enough maybe there's a lot more of these moments happening and things aren't quite there but there were so many in that 20 minute goal line stand that seems to suggest the team is unsure of their positions jalabert's knock on is the prime example but this is shit france tried to pull the trigger and go wide but the setup is terrible it's just hands down the line like an under 12s team against a modern international defense obviously they get eaten right Right up. If Ireland or Scotland, the two best attacks in this tournament, were in this situation, there's no way they call the ball out here without a triangle set up to slow the line speed and prevent the drift, as multiple runners may yet get the ball. The first guy can't just blitz and drift, they have to watch and wait and react to whatever this triangle produces. As it is, Italy can just push off as each pass comes, swamping and crushing the attack. It's the back's equivalent of one-up rugby. It's boring, it's dull, and it's shit. And yet, there was one functional attack, as after a half of disinterest in the ball faded, Italy clicked into gear and played some glorious, beautiful rugby, all eventually paying off with a brilliant try for sweepy stickman king and Capuzzo. Ever since Jonathan Dante saw himself sent off for taking a nibble of Nacho Brex's face, France found themselves changing defensive formation constantly for every Italian scrum. Some they kept eight in to prevent God King Spagnolo driving right through them, but knowing how Italy loved to isolate defenders and play wide, dropping a forward into the backs, here they move Paul Bordant from the back row into the fly half position. And Italy, Seeing this, look to run a normal exit play, sending the guarkless Brex running right up into the 10 channel. However, in order to ensure Bourdain doesn't just get skinned by Italy's delicious walking wardrobe, Ramos steps in to double up to make the tackle. Nuani's inside line here holds the Garrick, so France can't really afford to drift off, when Brex instead hits Varney on the loop. With Ramos too tight, no number 8 to break off the scrum because, you know, red card, and then 9 unable to get across, nobody is really marking the space here, so Tommaso Menoncello, who was absolutely incredible to say it again on Sunday, hits the gap with Ramos only making a half tackle, allowing him to set some sort of record surely for post-contact metres, making the offload to Varney, who then links up and gets Italy into nearing the French 22. Zuliani steps in the scrum off and goes for the undefendable spin move, learnt from his proud fellow countryman Super Mario, meaning Italy get quick ball and go through a few more phases. Brex hits another nice line here, allowing Zuliani to spam the spin move, bloody Smash Bros bullshit, but thankfully his opponent doesn't rage quit and it keeps Italy's momentum going forward. Now, we all know this equalising try, right? Eventually ends up finished by everyone's favourite altar boy, Ant Capowuzzo, but for a moment, I just want to take a look at the unseen work. The people off the ball who make this drive possible, running the lines to disrupt the defence without necessarily getting the ball. The dummy runners who deserve the glory as much as Capowuzzo himself. It is Capowuzzo himself. That makes a that makes a lot of sense. He deserves the glory then. His line off Garbizi here is outstanding, holding Talfi Fanua and stopping the defence from drifting, meaning when Paolo hits Brex, Talfi Fanua isn't in the gate and has to just stumble back on side. The carry is so dominant that none of the tacklers can pop back to their feet, and there's no threats to this ball. Nobody even needs to clear out. Varney 
able to just play it away. Now, Ireland have the best attack in the world, and one component that makes it so good is the fact that every player is always on their feet and always an option, always reloaded into position. They tend to go with the minimum amount of bodies required at a breakdown to win it, then everybody else is always running genuine, realistic lines to take defenders out of the game or handle the ball. In these closing stages, Italy's attack had all the same attributes, incredibly reminiscent of the Super Boys in Green. Canone here carries like a cannon, and Italy's attack is so far on top, only Ferrari is needed to secure the ball, meaning everyone else can focus on just being alive to the attack. God Garbisi is overwhelmed here with good options, stretching the French defence. He goes for the gap himself because they're not looking for him, they're keeping on all these bloody options, offloading to Lucchese, who has been able to join the attack here thanks to their speed of ball, having cleared out a few phases earlier himself, always keeping themselves alive. Marine hits a line and Ramos can only scrag him. Capuzzo works brilliantly off the ball, getting into the perfect position to take the money ball off Peno's desperate deflection. It's a brilliant try, well finished, well taken, all starting with a superb set move to target Bordon. Coupled with outstanding organisation, patience and having a men in cello once they begin to manipulate the space. Garbisi nails the conversion and we draw level. The game obviously came down to a dramatic conclusion and whilst we'll all have our own thoughts on France's decision to run the ball from deep from just outside their own 22 instead of kicking along when they still had time or indeed what came next, the undeniable factor was Italy. For years we've shouted, screamed, this will come good. On Sunday the talking was done purely on the pitch. France entered this tournament the second best team in the Six Nations, Italy having bombed out the World Cup in Paris, arguably their worst showing ever, only to be the width of a post away from the best result in their history a few months later. The Gonzalo Quesada era has only just begun, but it feels like those sharp intakes of breath, those beats of the heart and moments of stunned silence are going to be here for some time to come. Thank you for watching that. I hope you enjoyed it. There's plenty more around the Six Nations on the channel elsewhere. Please have a look around. There's one on what England are building under Steve Borthwick that went up in the last couple of days. There's going to be a video on Wales, in particular one position, coming next week. We may have looked at it in the past, a few years back. There's plenty more. There's a podcast as well looking at old games, the 2007 World Cup at the minute, but the 2011 and 2007. There's loads of other stuff. There'll be more coming. Thank you to everyone who has watched this, the Patreon people. You're all wonderful. You're all lovely. And we will see you very soon for more rugby. It was going to be a nice historical win if they did it. It didn't happen. Maybe, maybe next time.